Hi, Rutger. Hello. How are you? Good. Uh, Rutger, we are live today. So cool. let's just wait for a couple of minutes uh, for more people to join, if that's OK. Of course, sure. Right. Thank you. So meanwhile, I'll just drop a quick introduction about uh, Rutger and uh, the company CM.com, where he's from. So Rutger is a product person uh, who is going to be talking uh, about usage-based pricing. And uh, usage-based pricing is kind of a very hot topic today uh, with the rise of a lot of API-based solutions and people going creative and uh, uh, a lot of other factors influencing the buyer side of things. Usage-based pricing has become really popular nowadays. So we are going to be having a quick fireside chat with Rutger on that and uh, about cm.com so cm is a uh, cloud software for conversational commerce and it's not just that they provide other solutions uh, like sign and a bunch of other interesting stuff which you can head to the expo section and check out in their booth uh, so we also have kavi from uh, cm team who will help you at the booth right so it's six let's just wait uh, till six one and then get started with the session radhika of course, whenever you're ready. Thank you. All right, then let's get started with the session. Hey, Rutger, thank you so much for uh, coming in today as a speaker. It's uh, it's great hosting you. Uh, you're very welcome. So to get started, we would like to uh, first hear from you on what you think usage-based pricing is. Uh, and what it could potentially do for the growth of SaaS industry. Sure. So uh, I think traditionally speaking in SaaS, uh, we're all used to selling per seat, at least at the application level. This was pioneered by the giants in the industry, such as Salesforce. And it's a bit, been a model that's been around for quite some time, at least uh, as we define time uh, in, in software, which isn't necessarily that long, but for software terms, it's been around for a time. Uh, Usage-based pricing um, is sort of an evolution where pricing per seat is sort of a remnant of an old age where we didn't have um, better metrics to bill on. And Usage-based pricing is more of an evolution where, hey, we've isolated metrics that are more aligned with customers extracting value from the product, and maybe we should give it a try and bill people uh, based on those uh, metrics. It's taken yeah. off uh, predominantly at the infrastructure and middleware layer, but it's now sort of bubbling up into the application landscape. And that's, uh, generally speaking, I think what we're going to talk about. Yep. Uh, so as you just mentioned, uh, usage-based pricing uh, has not been around traditionally. It's, it's only been uh, in the last couple of years that we're seeing a lot more of it. And uh, we are mostly used uh, to more of a licensing model, user-based licensing model. So if, if a company decides to migrate from this user-based to usage-based, what do you think they should consider before uh, you know, making this entire shift? Is a, are there any certain metrics that's like critical for uh, the companies to uh, track? Or uh, yeah, that's the basic idea of this question. What should companies look into before making this shift? Sure. It's also important to note, though, that the trend is new. But for some companies, it's been around for quite some time, right? Yeah. Pioneers like WebEx, who used to bill uh, video conferencing uh, per minute. CM itself has been around since 1999. So that's before like the burst of the tech bubble, so ancient. Uh, and it also uh, started off with pay-as-you-go for SMS messaging. But the bigger trend is something of the most recent years, like three, four, or five years, uh, something like that. Now, I think what you should com consider if you're actually transitioning from selling per seat, so per license or per user, um, at that time, you probably also already have some critical mass. So you have a seriously established company. You've been successfully or moderately successfully selling with uh, a seed model, tracking MRR, ARR, ARPU, uh, all that type of stuff. And now you want to transition away from that. So because you already have an established uh, company, you're now introducing something that's not just a pricing page change. Like, hey, we're going to go from seats to usage-based pricing. Now, this filters down throughout the company, all departments. So it's not just product. It's not just product marketing, not just marketing, not just sales. It's customer success. It's support. It's legal. It's finance. It's everything, right? 
For example, if you want to uh, report to shareholders, uh, whether they be private investors or you're publicly uh, listed uh, about your uh, financial performance, it used to be the case that you used MRR and ARR, you know, and these are all very predictable. Right. That's one of the big benefits of, of the subscription model uh, selling per seat is predictability. Whereas with usage based pricing, of course, you have peaks and valleys uh, as usage increases uh, in your company, whether that's uh, sort of a market wide thing or for a couple of customers specifically, you're going to get more peaks and valleys. So your revenue uh, is going to become more unpredictable. So. Just on a finance and risk level already, that means that you need a team of analysts to start predicting revenue so you know what to report to your shareholders, again, be they uh, uh, private investors or, or, or uh, publicly uh, or public investors. And that's just the finance part, right? And if we look at each of those departments, you're going get, to get those changes. Uh, you have to get them in place. For example, sales. If you have traditional distribution where you sell licenses per seat, um, and you're very reliant on like traditional new business outbound sales. Mm -hmm. With the usage based model, you're going to need people with an entirely different skill set that just mm -hmm. get the pilot up and going. And then you have the concept of land and expand. So the biggest part of your growth in the usage based model is supposed to be after the sale rather than mm -hmm. uh, upon closing the deal. So the type of people that you need for more of the account management, that's an entirely different skill set. Mm -hmm. And we could sort of visit every department uh, within a software company in our minds and say, okay, what's got to change there? And we would find something. So again, legal, marketing, product, marketing, product. So it's a strategic change for the entire business. Uh, and you shouldn't underestimate the impact uh, if you're going to transition in an existing business uh, to that model. It's different, of course, if you're a startup and if you're looking to start, in which case it also has a lot of impact to make the, that choice. But at least um, you don't have to make any changes because there's nothing there yet. Got it. Got it. That actually explains a lot. And uh, moving on to the second question is uh, a little controversial about usage-based pricing itself. And uh, the question itself uh, is if the usage-based pricing concept, is it overhyped? Or uh, how did the trend even you know start picking up in the recent years? Where, was there a trigger? Was there a company that made it really popular among the uh, mass public of SaaS, a B2B SaaS segment? Yeah, I think to ask the question is to answer it, or at least partially. Right? Okay. Is it is is it overhyped? Uh, sure, a little bit, as with most things in technology. I think you could say it sort of follows the Gardner hype cycle. You know, where you have like the trigger and then the peak of inflated expectations and the trough of disillusionment and slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity. Blah blah blah, all that type of stuff. Right. So people start talking about it. It becomes somewhat of a hype. And then afterwards, once the peak is over, you all realize, hey, there's just something useful here. There's something uh, uh, to learn. Um, I think the areas in which it's been overhyped is that sometimes it's presented as a panacea for all of your growth issues, right? Mm -hmm. Which it isn't. It's a pricing model. If you, if you change your pricing pace, it's not like there's a magic flick of the switch and all of a sudden your revenue starts booming. There's more involved, the devil is in the details, and it's all about the execution. Mm -hmm. um, another part, I think, where it may be overhyped is that people sometimes present this as a model that will work for everyone, every but type of business, every product, uh, regardless of what you're doing, which of course is, is also very unnuanced thing to say and not completely true. It works for a lot of people and it works for a lot of products, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work for everything. Now, in terms of how the trend started picking off, uh, picking up, as I mentioned, there have been a couple of companies that have been doing this from the start, right? Because usage-based pricing just makes the most sense. And what we've seen is that this is predominantly at the infrastructure level and the middleware level of the stack, of the tech stack. So we've got, say, infrastructure at the bottom. Then on top of that, we've got middleware. On top of that, again, we've got the experience layer or the application level right so at the very top 
SaaS as we're used to, right? And then uh, API business in the middle and then mm -hmm. infrastructure stuff at the bottom like uh, Snowflake, AWS, Microsoft Azure, um, DigitalOcean, basically heavy living infrastructure stuff like that. It, yeah, and it was, it was pioneered at the middleware and infrastructure level because it makes a lot of sense there. I think there are a couple of reasons for it. Um, first, that the metrics that people bill on in the middleware and infrastructure uh, layer uh, make a lot of sense to end users regardless of whether or not you use them for billing, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, number of API transactions or uh, number of voice OTPs sent or number of two-factor authentication SMS messages sent, right? As an end user, these are statistics that you are very well aware of. Same for the infrastructure layer. If we're talking about storage or uh, or compute expressed in CPU or whatever it is you're using, mm -hmm. as the end user, you're aware of these things and you use those stats on a daily basis just for your work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, companies then decide to bill on it. And for you, it's very easy to look at a competitive landscape and to make like for like comparisons across mm -hmm. these companies, right? Mm -hmm. So API company, a, API company B, uh, oh, this costs, uh, I don't know, 10x dollars for so many transactions, this costs 20x dollars for so many transactions, that like for like comparison becomes very easy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always been a logical thing at that layer to, to build on those types of metrics. Whereas if you move up in the stack, mm -hmm. it's less logical right? Because it's very difficult for a broad SaaS product to find one ubiquitous holy grail metric that sort of captures all of the value as your customer grows, right? Sort of a, a darling, a, a crowd favorite at the application level when we talk about user-based pricing is HubSpot, right? Mm -hmm. They transitioned from sort of the tra tra uh, traditional model uh, to usage-based pricing based on number of contacts. Mm -hmm. So number of marketing contacts uh, in your CRM. Mm -hmm. So you pay X when you have 5,000, you pay Y when you have 10,000 and so on and so forth. Um, now, what's difficult with that is to capture the full value uh, mm -hmm. of what you're doing there. Because for example, with B2C, this works extremely well, right? As you scale number of contacts, you scale your reach. But if you go to B2B, for example, you may have very high information density for every single contact and very high communication density for every contact, but you may not necessarily need a lot of contacts. So pricing doesn't, value increases for you, but the pricing may not scale with it as easily. And what you wanna to get to is that um, as usage increases at your customer, value also increases. So they look at their bill and think, okay, last month I was paying you a hundred bucks. Now I'm paying you 200, but I don't care because I also got extra value out of it. And mm -hmm. to capture all of that value at the application level is a little more tricky than when it's uh, only API transactions or only you know, one VM, two VMs, uh, three servers, four servers, five servers. Got it. Great. So uh, quickly moving on to the next question. And before that, I uh, see that uh, Kushal Raj from the audience has a really nice question. Kushal Raj, would you like to have a conversation directly with Vatkar on this? Uh, if yes, then just uh, you should find, uh, you know, ask, uh, ask to share audio or video on screen. Just do it and I'll quickly push you to the screen. So meanwhile, moving on to the next question, Vatkar. Um, sure. What sort of companies do you think can adopt or do have the potential to adopt this usage-based pricing? Now, we do know that API-based companies are a sure shot one. Zapier yeah. uh, is, is, is a classic example of uh, usage-based pricing. And uh, what about CRMs? Uh, can they potentially do it? Or is there a hidden vertical that can, you know, uh, in future adopt to usage-based pricing? Yeah. I'm not sure if it's necessarily uh, about uh, verticals, but I think, uh, you know, API based companies and infrastructure companies are always logical uh, uh, candidates and it gets tricky at the uh, application level. So I think what's important there is can you service the full spectrum of company sizes? So that's small, small business, medium sized businesses, 
and like hardcore enterprise. And the reason is uh, one of the big benefits of usage-based pricing is this land and expand model where you maybe start out with someone who does one API transaction and then they scale to a thousand, to 10,000, to a hundred thousand, maybe to a million and so on uh, and so forth. And to scale with them is just a technical question. One server, two servers, three servers, who cares? Same at the infrastructure level. At the application level, you get tangible changes in functional requirements as you scale with your customer. Now, this is where it can be tricky, right? So if we were to ask a designer like, hey, design me an interface for an omni-channel agent inbox that's very suitable for five users, mm -hmm. they would go and design something. And then we ask the same question, but now please do it for 5,000. This product's gonna look completely different. Functional requirements are gonna change. So what you oftentimes see uh, in that type of uh, SaaS applications is that there's churn at the top due to uh, features. So it's always churn at the bottom due to price, churn at the top due to features. So your customers can essentially outgrow you. So say, you know, we need this feature now, we need that one, we need that one. We've grown so much uh, that your development speed has not kept up with our evolving uh, needs. So that points out an enormous difference between the infrastructure companies and API companies and the application companies. The first two only have to do technical scalability, more servers, you know, more VMs, uh, whatever. But at the application level, we're talking about sometimes drastic changes in design principles or drastic functional changes to be able to scale across the full lifetime of your customers, right? So again, we have that example of the person who starts out with one API transaction and scales to a million. But for example, in the service domain, if you start out with five agents and you wanna to scale to a full-size contact center of 5,000, that may mm -hmm. require an entirely different product. So because mm -hmm. you have that turn at the top, almost mm -hmm. by definition sometimes, um, there is less total growth available in the land and expand strategy because by definition, you're gonna have more churn than the other two categories, which are API-based and infrastructure-based, because you cannot keep on growing with your customer indefinitely. There is a cap to scaling. Got it. Thank you so much. So, uh, hey, Kushal Raj, we're adding to, uh, you to the stage now. Hey, hi. Um, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, please feel free to share your video and tell us, uh, you know, a little bit your, uh, about yourself and uh, a little bit of more insight into the question that uh, you are asking. Definitely. I am so sorry. I cannot switch on my video because no I problem. have joined from a desktop. Very sorry for that. I can hear no people. Talking about. Cool. I will give a little bit of context on this question. So we've seen, uh, like, you know, you've rightly pointed out API and infrastructure-based companies can definitely go on that land and expand model. But what about traditional SaaS companies, something, let's say, of a contact management, uh, sales management tool like Pipedrive, or let's say a HRMS tool. Uh, it's very difficult um, for the decision makers to even think of paying about, you know, usage-based pricing for them because they are so accustomed at let's say the mid market and at the larger scale enterprises, they're ac accustomed to paying a monthly uh, cost for the product that they you know buy. So with with SMEs and startups, it's very easy. They see the uh, API based, you know, they pay EC2 instance uh, for every minute, so they're okay with you know going ahead and paying for a tool uh, for let's say a per contact or per employee for HR. But at that mid market and larger enterprises, how do you? overcome that apprehension from the decision makers and say, hey, probably, you know, this is a good thing for you. Uh, you'll be essentially paying less right now and uh, you might pay a little more at the future if you expand, but then they're so accustomed to paying, let's say a fixed cost of $10,000 per month. And they don't even want to look at your model and give it a shot. And that cycle continues with a lot of company and, you know, you never see uh, usage-based pricing in uh, these kind of products. So what do you think uh, should be a strategy for a company that wants to do that? That's a very good question, right? And it points to that sort of competitive landscape locking you up. So if you sell, uh, for example, CRM and everyone in the industry has a has a user-based uh, pricing model and you're sort of the strange one coming along, doing it differently, saying, oh, yeah, no, we bill you uh, based on the amount of contacts, you get this problem 
that uh, prospects or buyers cannot make a like for like or difficult and difficultly uh, make a like for like comparison uh, between the prices. So the way to escape is to look for a common denominator, right? So you start looking at, okay, if you procure uh, so and so many licenses from uh, player B, how many contacts would you have in the system, right? So you need to get those metrics aligned and say, okay, um, yes, with this competitor, you would have uh, 50 licenses uh, and 10,000 contacts, uh, and it would cost you this much. We don't look at licenses, but we do look at contacts. So for the same amount of contacts, 10,000, it would cost you that much. So you can only look at it at the total level, at the aggregate level of the total price is where they can make the like for like comparison. And then you've got to you know, take them by the hand in calculating, okay, how will this model scale for you? Or how will both models scale for you, that one of our competitor and our own? So we're going to make a calculation for 20,000 contacts or an equivalent of 200 seats now. And we're going to do it for the triple amount and the quadruple amount and really sort of yeah, draw them a graph of uh, how this pricing model is going to go with them. Because if you don't do it as a salesperson, you're asking them to do it themselves, right? Mm -hmm. It just means they have to make an effort, which prospects, uh, as you know, don't like. Mm. Um, and also, they may just not know where to start because these metrics sometimes are not evidently known to them. For example, if I look at our own product in, in, in the service industry, if I were to ask all of my customers today, how many messages come into your account and are sent out in total on a monthly level? I am 100% sure that all of them would answer with, I don't know, I'll have to look it up, right? So you really have to take them by the hand if you're uh, billing on those types of metrics uh, and you have to do that work for them. And still, you know, it could be the case uh, that they're wary uh, to buy your product. Um, with early adopters, this will be less the case. With the early majority, this will always be a struggle. So you also have to ask yourself if, if the full market, say 100 players are selling uh, the user base way, do you want to be that first pioneer? Because yes, it can have a big payoff if, if it works, but it can also fail dramatically and all of your efforts will be wasted. So maybe being a bit conservative and letting someone else in the market take the lead on that is not necessarily a, a bad idea if that's the market that you're in. Okay. Okay. I think that's uh, that's a good answer for that. And one more one more follow up on this question, if I have that time. So you uh, spoke. We still have three more minutes. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, Can I ask one small question? So you spoke sure, about sure, you know sure. one ubiquitous holy grail metric. And yeah. If you're a large SaaS, how do you find that one ubiquitous holy grail metric? Uh, how yeah. do you, How do you do that? That, that, that's the catch, right? It probably isn't there, but you have to pick one or two or maybe max three uh, to keep things understandable for your customer. So I think what we're gonna see a lot in SaaS is the hybrid model, right? It doesn't all have to be usage-based. It may make sense for part of your product and it may make no sense at all for another part of your product. So, um, Maybe for, for example, the amount of messages that you sent or amount of contacts or amount of conversations or whatever metric you can find, uh, it will make sense. But still for a large part of the value in your features, you also want to have that usage-based price, right? And there are lots of companies that have this hybrid model. Um, easy example, Slack, right? They have a generous free tier. If you exceed an X number of messages, then you pay per seat. So it's a combination of usage-based uh, and seed pricing, which works very well for them. And every product's unique, um, including yours. So uh, it, yeah, it's sort of taking a hard look at which model will work the best for you. And just understanding upfront that that one holy grow metric is probably not there. You're not gonna find it. Perfect, thank you so much. I'll mute myself here. Thank you for your question. Go ahead. Right, uh, I, guys, I think we are uh, at the end of our session today. I mean, there is the Rutger, there are still a lot of questions from the audience. I still have a lot of questions for you, but unfortunately, we, we are going to have a hot stop over here. Uh, so, to the audience, if you have questions, please tweet it to Rutger tagging CM and SAS Insider. I've left the 
Uh, Twitter ID is on the chat over here. And yeah, thank you all for attending this session. The next session, session will start uh, in five minutes. So feel free to head to the next session about other product topics happening today. Thank you so much, Rutger, for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Hey, guys, for the next two sessions, we have uh, really interesting speakers from Betafy and from Microsoft who are going to be